a couple of random notes uh, as we get started today. Uh, I had the um, distinct experience of, uh, of drinking whiskey and discussing politics and religion with Uncle Bob last night. And if you've followed his, either, of his, <coughs> either of his internet personas, um, <coughs> you can have some idea of what that's about. And in the course of, uh, in the course of that conversation, I divulged to him uh, some things that I'm going to say about Neil right now. And he said that he didn't believe... I think he didn't believe either that they were true or that I was going to say them. Uh, but in fact, they are true. I am going to say them. And uh, Neil is just a really, really very close friend. He is a real mensch. He is, uh, has been a huge inspiration and support to me throughout my career over the last several years. And he is um, one of only two people here in the room that I've slept with. And, but I really am looking forward to getting to know a lot of you <laughs> better uh, as the conference goes on. There's, there's no book giveaway tomorrow. There's a, <laughs> so I also want to say that, that it's really cool that the uh, Joy of Closure guys are uh, you know, signing their book. But I think you really have to put pressure on sort of what they're willing to do. So I had them sign my forehead. And I think, I think the rest of you should all approach them and ask to have different body parts signed throughout the day. Uh, they, would, they would really appreciate that, and particularly if you make the suggestion that you didn't actually bother to buy or read the book, that you're just, you know, sort of uh, pursuing fame. So uh, I'm going to get out of Neil's way. Uh, this is Neil Ford, meme wrangler at ThoughtWorks, and he's going to help us uh, dominate the world. We'll see. So welcome, everyone. This is uh, Neil's master plan for closure enterprise mindshare domination, um, which is what I was kind of asked to talk about here because, unfortunately, I don't get to spend a lot of time doing closure at my day job yet. I'm working hard on that with a bunch of my colleagues at ThoughtWorks to make that more possible. But the thing I do as part of my day job an awful lot is talk to uh, enterprise developers and CTOs and folks like that. So I thought I might have some perspective uh, that you guys might appreciate. And uh, so I've put together some plans for ways to penetrate the enterprise, and I've hashtagged all of them so that they're easier to uh, talk about later and uh, dispute me over drinks and uh, that sort of stuff. So most of the talks here are about this, not surprisingly, since we're at a, a uh, closure conference. But most of my talk is going to be more about this. Those of you who know some physics know that this is mu, which is the coefficient of friction in physics. And that's what my talk is about more than lambda, is about mu, which is about friction and overcoming friction for things. And I'm going to do this for uh, three topics. How do things become popular in the enterprise world? How do you make something popular? And how do you build a bridge to popularity if you're not popular but you really want to be? So the first one I'll, I'll ask is, how do things become popular in enterprises? Because they don't work like the rest of the world. They don't work like Hollywood or books or anything like that. Uh, there are two different ways that things become popular in big companies and enterprises. They either rain down from the top, or they sprout up organically from the bottom. So let's talk about both of those things, because if our goal is to get closure more deeply penetrated in the enterprise, then we can take either of these two approaches, and there are some strategies around either of these two approaches. <clears throat> As some of you probably know, I do a lot of other uh, conferences. Um, I speak at the No Fluff Just Stuff conference series, which is where I ultimately met Stu, and that's where that shirt came from, was uh, Stu Camp, which is kind of loosely related to No Fluff Just Stuff. And this is one of the talks that I'm doing on the No Fluff Just Stuff tour this year and a bunch of other conferences I'm speaking at, this talk called Build Your Own Technology Radar. And this talk is based around this thing that ThoughtWorks creates called the, the ThoughtWorks Technology Radar, which is put together by the ThoughtWorks tab, which is a group of technologists from all the offices in the world. We get together three or four times a year and come up with this radar, which is now published as kind of a white papery kind of thing that looks like this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to give you a flavor for it. It's basically the technologies that we think are hot and uh, where they are. And then each page, each subsequent page, takes one of the quadrants and goes into a little bit of detail about why we think that's so. Or if there's some controversial things, we try to explain what the controversy is. And then there's finally some marketing stuff. When we do this, we have these rings on our radar. The outermost ring is a ring called hold. And those are things that we're saying 
Don't avoid it, but don't start anything new with this technology. And then as you creep inward further, you get assess, which is things that you should be trying. Trial, which is, oh, we think this is going to be useful. We should do some real projects on it and see what it's going to be like. And then finally, adopt in the center ring. So the idea here is when you put together a radar, you think about the technologies that you want to pursue, and you put them in one of these circles, and then over time, hopefully, the good ones will move toward the, the center as you adopt them. Part of the exercise that I have people go through for this is to build two distinct radars. One radar for developers to help manage your own career, which is a good idea, and another one for you, the CTO of your company. So realize that the No Fluff Just Stuff conference series is mostly people who work in the corporate world, in enterprises, and they're mostly Java developers in the corporate world. And so they have a pretty good perspective, I think, on their CTOs and the kind of things that they're interested in. And as part of building this uh, CTO radar, I have them put together some litmus tests for how to choose new technologies. This is how you determine if you're going to choose a new technology or not. How do you determine the next big thing? What are the litmus tests that you apply to a technology to decide, do I want to spend more time delving into and finding out what that technology is about? And the interesting thing about this is that for the developer radars, it's all over the map. You get all kinds of interesting litmus tests. In fact, when I do the talk, I kind of crowdsource and let people put together all these litmus tests for things that they uh, choose new technologies. But more interesting than that is when they put on the CTO hat because universally the litmus tests for the CTOs are the same. Across the entire country, I've done this talk this year, and it's universally across the U.S. that there are a few key litmus tests that CTOs apparently everywhere apply on things. And one of the biggest ones is got to be able to hire tons of inexpensive developers. That's what CTOs care about a lot. I need a whole lot of warm bodies to fill my HR queue for people. Whether they're very good or not is not, is not even that much of a concern. It's availability that seems to be the big thing. That's the big fear. This is a big fear. A lot of you are in the Ruby on Rails world, and a lot of you, as we tried to get Rails into enterprises, that was the number one fear people had was, if I adopt this technology stack, how am I ever going to hire people to, to write code in it? Of course, there's kind of a flawed assumption here is that you need dozens or hundreds of developers to do stuff, and we've had a really hard time convincing people that, you know, if you just hire eight or nine really good developers, you can build a lot of really good stuff, but that's a really hard uh, argument as well. But really what this is, is I'm afraid, because I don't want to choose something that is, might put my job at risk, and so I will easily pick something that is less effective but more industry accepted rather than something riskier where I might risk really good success but also failure. Uh, I was in a meeting, this is years and years ago, I, I, long, long time ago, and this will come up a little bit later, uh, I was uh, really in the Delphi world, and then my first book was a Delphi book, and I, uh, back in the Delphi world, Power Builder was also a big thing, and I literally was in a meeting at one point with a CTO, and he said, we believe that the only way this project will ever be a success is if we pick Delphi, but we're picking Power Builder. Knowing that it's going to fail, but that's the safer choice politically, because if they pick Delphi, they might win, but they might lose, and if they lose and they pick something weird, then they get fired. But if they pick the industry standard thing and they still lose, then they don't get fired. They've just got a failed project. And so they, I was literally sitting in a room with people who said, we're going to let this project fail by picking the wrong technology rather than taking a chance on it might being successful. So that's the kind of mentality that you have to deal with a lot of times in the enterprise world. And so that's actually my first suggestion about how to get into the enterprise is mollify. You've got to make these guys less afraid of you. You've got to find a way to tell them Look, it's not a brand new uh, platform. It's just a new language on top of an existing platform. They're afraid of changing languages and not being able to find developers. So you're going to have to find all those fears and address each one of those fears before you're ever going to make them happy about this uh, or make them think that this is not too risky a choice to risk success on a project. Because that's the only place you really need to get to is get them to the point where they're willing to risk success not all the way to the point to prevent failure. And one way to mollify them is to create new closures everywhere you possibly can. So this is something the communica community can do. So do things like sponsor sick pee groups, which I know you're already doing some of this stuff, but try to get this far and wide as much as possible. 
build some assets to make it really easy to work through sick pee. I know there were some people that were working through get, getting all the sick pee examples to work in closure. That's a really great idea. Post some tutorials and guides out there in the world and get people interested in that. Um, create something like the poignant guide in Ruby, something that's really compelling and it's freely available. You re we really could use a why the lucky stiff in the closure community, but we don't really have one of those, and not one of those exactly, but we need something like that, only a closure flavored one, if that makes sense. You should lurk around schools. <laughs> not in the bad sense, mind you, but get closure into schools everywhere. I mean, Lisp is a great language, it's a first computer language. MIT did that for years. Try to get some local high schools interested in this, or try to get some high school user groups of people. One of the speakers here is 17. It's not that uh, unlikely. In fact, he's already lurking around school. So just get him to go ahead and send your message around. Do things like cone contests. You know, that's, that was really huge in the Ruby world to get people used to Ruby was all the Ruby cones and edge case put together this really slick, easily downloadable thing where you can play with those. That, something like that is a, a really nice thing to have around. They have it. Okay. So that's just something I haven't seen. So that's exactly the kind of stuff you need. I know that there are functional cones, but is it as packaged nicely as the Ruby ones? I haven't seen that. Okay, good. So CTOs don't fear Lisp. They don't even know what Lisp is. They fear different universally. So don't try to sell them on Lisp. That's just a waste of time. You're just using a word they don't know. You've got to sell them on there's some reason that this is different is good for whatever you're, uh, whatever you're trying to do. And the other thing you can do is make closure commonplace. Um, and I'll talk more about that in one of my other strategies here in just a second, but make it a building block for a whole bunch of other stuff so that the closure jar file becomes this viral thing that ends up everywhere and people are using it whether they realize it or not. So that's how things rain down from above and become popular. You get the CTO interested in it and he rains down on people and says you should use this. The other way that technology has penetrated enterprise is by sprouting up from the bottom. And uh, so Stu told a little bit of embarrassing history about me. I'm going to tell you a much more embarrassing history about myself. My first actual professional development was in Clipper. How many people here even know what Clipper is? I'm sure that a few of you do, but uh, it's a pretty rare thing these days. Clipper, you used it when you were 16. There you go. So you were lurking around schools at 16 trying to get them to use Clipper instead of Closure. So, I see. Uh, Clipper was an X-base little language. Uh, you could actually turn a clipper into a fully object-oriented language, and we wrote some redonkulously cool object-oriented frameworks for building clipper applications. But uh, as we were doing that, and I was actually the CTO of a little consulting training company that was doing some clipper development, and it actually disappeared overnight when Windows came along. It was shocking how fast it just went away. And so this is kind of my technology stack after clipper. I did DBase for Windows for a while, which was a horror. I did uh, Delphi, which was actually really nice, because you could get a lot of really cool stuff done in Delphi. It was way ahead of its time. I did Borland C++ Builder, which is also a horror. You know, there's a lot of Borland stuff there. I did a lot of Java stuff and JBuilder, and I've done Ruby on Rails and, and a bunch of other stuff. But other people who came from the same kind of background I did, the Clipper world, didn't take this same route through technology. They took a different route. Uh, they took from Clipper, and the supposed logical upgrade step from Clipper was this thing called Visual Objects that the company that made Clipper was making. And it was supposed to be this really nice, you know, it was one of those marketing things that it does everything including cure cancer kind of things and it never came to fruition. It was not that great. But a lot of those folks moved, when they moved to Windows, to Delphi because it was the quickest way to get stuff done. This is in the RAD, Rapid Application Development World, and Delphi was the best RAD tool out there for really cranking stuff out fast. A lot of those folks, when the, the, they moved away from Windows and desktop development and moved to web development, a few of those moved then to Ruby on Rails. There's a group of developers that I'm going to characterize here as what I refer to as productivity pirates. They don't care about the underlying technology or the beauty or the elegance of the underlying technology. They just care about getting shit done. And they'll take any platform that allows them to get stuff done with as little friction as possible. And that's one of the things you can do to get this kind of grassroots support is build some tools that really supports these productivity pirates, hoist a pirate flag for productivity for these guys. 
because these guys are very, very um, focused on being able to get stuff done. If you give them some treasure chests, you'll get really, really big fans uh, because they'll start using your stuff like crazy all over the place. So what are the things, some of the things you could do to, to address these guys? Well, you could build a web framework, but that's kind of boring. Everybody's got web frameworks now. Sorry, Howard, but that's, everybody's done one of those. But there are some other really interesting problems that haven't really been addressed and haven't really touched this productivity pirate crowd yet, I don't think. Things like uh, RESTful integration. This is a big deal in enterprises right now, switching from SOAP to REST and getting everything to talk to one another. All the tools universally suck in that space. I can imagine creating a really nice uh, piece of RESTful integration with some DSLs and some other stuff that would uh, make that way less painful than it is now. Really nasty, pervasive problems like OR mapping. I think we've probably spent a trillion dollars on OR mapping so far, and we still haven't solved this problem. Uh, so addressing that would be a really cool thing. Another thing that I see pop up all over the place that I think Clojure would be absolutely beautifully suited for are things like rules engines. I see a lot of companies investing time and effort in these rules engines with this fantasy that they'll let their end users create and, and massage these rules, which never works in my experience because end users are not developers, so they end up creating these horrific sets of trees, of decision trees. You can't refactor these things, and so you end up with duplicated logic all over the place. There's a, a wide open space because a lot of companies want that, but all the existing tools out in the world are terrible for this. There's a wide open space there to move in there and kind of take over that space. Or some new category of tool we haven't even thought about yet. That obviously is the coolest thing, but a little bit harder to come up with. So if you are going to sneak things in from the bottom, there are two ways to do that. You can either do breaking and entering, or you can do it via cat burglary. Breaking and entering is exactly how Linux and Rails made it into the enterprise. And by breaking and entering, I mean they forced the enterprise to accept them and do all the work that it took to make that, that stuff possible. Linux got in because people in the data center started running it as an alternative to all the commercial software, and it took a foothold, and then it became popular. Rails is the same way. You had to convince people to move to the LAMP stack. It's a really hard discussion to have with enterprises because that is, you think, put a CTO hat on for a second. Switching to a new deployment stack is gigantically expensive because you've got to have machines and people and all the support infrastructure and all that stuff. But Linux managed to do that because it was compelling enough to be able to break and enter and get enough momentum going. So was Ruby on Rails. And this is, of course, part of that. Uh, hoisting the pirate flag is pushing, breaking one of these technologies into an enterprise. But this is really hard to do. It's got to be super compelling, and everybody in the world has to believe that that's pretty compelling because the thing that you're trying to get over is the fear that I might get fired for choosing this technology stack. You have to get enough of a groundswell to say, okay, uh, this is not crazy risky. It's only a little bit risky, and that's enough to make them say, well, maybe we can... Uh, try to be successful. That's the hardest way to get something in. It's got to be really splashy. There's got to be a really clear-cut elevator case for that technology to be able to break and enter. Cat burglary is actually a lot easier and probably the better approach for this community. A uh, cat burglary is where you piggyback your technology in on top of some other technologies based on yours. Ruby is making it into a lot of companies right now that it could not make it in before on the back of Cucumber because people want Cucumber and, oh, it has to have Ruby to be able to run. In fact, uh, one of my friends, who's also a NoFluff speaker, Nate Shuda, he works for a big, giant insurance company, and the development group had been trying for several years to get Ruby as an approved language, and they couldn't. CTO's like, nope, we do Java, that's it. That's the approved language. But then there, another completely different business analyst group said, we want Cucumber. They said, oh, you guys want Cucumber? Okay, that's fine. And you need Ruby? Okay, that's fine. And they checked off Ruby, and now the development group has Ruby because it got through the door via Cucumber. That's cat burglary. The same thing is happening with Groovy on top of Gradle. Gradle is this build tool that's based on Groovy. People are picking Gradle, and they don't realize that Groovy is piggybacking in on, on its back. Companies that you ask them, are you doing Ruby development? Oh, absolutely not. Are you using Cucumber? Oh, yeah, it's great. So they don't realize that they're doing it, but they are. 
This is exactly how XML piggybacked in on the back of, well, pretty much everything. <laughs> so this is my strategy that I refer to as camouflage. Camouflage your tech and build it into other tools and get it all over the place kind of by accident. You get the closure drawer file in all these places and people can start assuming, oh, that's just infrastructure. We can start using that stuff. Try to make closure drawer file as commonplace as the antler drawer file. Have you seen how many places the antler drawer file shows up? It's everywhere. That's exactly what you want to do with closure is get that everywhere because if it's already on people's machines and it's piggybacked in on something else, then it's not such a scary thing anymore because we're already using it. We just didn't realize we were using it. This is also a great way to mollify CTOs about scariness because if it's camouflaged, they don't really see it and they've been using it for a long time before they realize they've been using this new frightening scary thing. So that's all about how things become popular. So how do you make something popular? For those of you who know me, this is going to be a, a shocking statement, but I need to say it. One of the ways that you make something popular with a community like Clojure is to be like Fox News. <laughs> Not in the misinformation kind of part of Fox News, but in the stick on message part of Fox News. And propagandize. Now, when you hear propaganda, you almost always have a negative connotation for it, but the denotation of, pro of propaganda is not a bad thing. It basically says a form of communication that's aimed at influencing attitude, it's not necessarily good or bad. We kind of put bad things on it, but it's not. A propaganda is actually a good thing if you're propagandizing something that's really good. Uh, vaccinations. In the early days, there was a big propaganda campaign by the U.S. government to get people to use vaccinations because it was a health benefit and that was a good propaganda campaign. And my point here is that you're trying to get people to do something that they're a little bit frightened of, stay on message, create a good unified message that the closer community can project and stay on that message really hard. And I don't know what that message is going to be, the community's got to decide what that is, but as a community, you should really hammer on these things. Anytime somebody brings up this topic, this should be the message you give them first. You'll give them a bunch of other nuanced messages as well, but you want to be able to hit them with this message first because if you can do that, then that, the knowledge of whatever that is will spread through the community and make people less afraid of things. So maybe it's something like high performance. Maybe it's something like Rich's talk on a simple uh, made easy, which is a really, really compelling talk. I thought that was really good. I saw that at Strange Loop. Um, this idea that closure is a vision for software, not just a language. Uh, Rich, in his uh, simple Made Easy talk, had this beautiful, beautiful uh, metaphor that we should use a lot, which is the knitted castle. Uh, that is the awesomest metaphor ever for object-oriented software, this idea of a knitted castle versus a Lego castle, where when you're doing object-oriented software with all this mutable states, you're knitting a castle, and can you imagine refactoring the knitted castle? That is such an awesome metaphor. So pimp the knitted castle everywhere you can. This is a, a kit that you can buy on Amazon. In fact, every one of you should buy the knitted castle kit and make a knitted castle at home just so you can carry it around and say, this is what your software looks like. So try to stay on message. Try to stay relentlessly positive. I think a, a good exemplar that this community could look at to uh, make good headroads, even against strong odds, is the J. Ruby community, and particularly Charlie Nutter, who is, despite coming against really steep odds in the very early days, because the Ruby community really had a lot of disdain for J. Ruby. Ah, that'll never actually work right, and it's slow, and all this other stuff, but he has stayed relentlessly positive, and he has made the, the community a better place over and over and over again. A lot of people in the J. Ruby community have have managed to stay positive and keep building cool stuff, and now they keep getting mind share, and more and more people in the Ruby community care less about what the underlying tech is. They care more about the technical characteristics, like do I want native threads or not, and they've gotten away from the bias that was there before. A lot of that is he's stayed on message, and he's been relentlessly positive forever. The last thing I'll talk about is how do you build a bridge to popularity if you're not popular yet? 
And I'll come to what I view as probably the most significant technical advantage this community has over all the other communities that you're competing against for mind share is that you guys are bringing a gun to a knife fight because you have lisp. And that is a serious advantage over everybody else you're going to be dealing with. So, pack heat. <laughs> if you believe you have an advantage, I think that you do, then prove it. Every time somebody comes up and says something about mine is simpler or more elegant or whatever it is, prove it. Say, oh, no, we can write that, but it'll be better than, than yours is because of the characteristics that we have. I firmly believe that a good Lisp developer can run rings around a good developer in any other language X, and I think the community should really show that. That's one of the ways that we're going to mollify people, is to show that we can really build effective stuff in this community. You should also know who your enemies are. And I think you've got a pretty good idea, uh, but your enemies are absolutely not agility and agile and things like testing, which you guys know. It's not things like Scala. Even though you are competitors, you're not enemies, your enemy is absolutely status quo. That's the thing you've got to fight, is status quo. Don't infight amongst functional programming communities or agile communities, because that's not the problem you need to solve first. That is a battle you can fight 10 years from now when the, the enterprise mindshare domination talk is, is it going to be closure or Scala? Then you can start fighting with those guys. Until that time, you need to stop fighting with them. And I believe that Scala has a head start. In fact, I have a quote that is a counterexample of what I just showed you, which I believe Scala is going to be the next big thing on the JVM because it fetishizes complexity exactly the way Java developers are used to fetishizing complexity. <laughs> and this is going to be a hard thing to beat because it's going to be hard to make closure look as complex as Scala. But actually, you should not do this. You should stop saying things like this as a community. You can say it as individuals, but as a community, because these guys are not your enemies. Imperativity is more an enemy than Scala is at this point in time. You need to befriend these communities. You've got to be able to sell, first, alternate language to Java. That's hard. You're going to mostly not be successful with this. That's going to be your first battle. But if you can get past that battle, then you've got to sell functional. If you get past that battle, then you've got to pick dynamic. And you can actually flip-flop functional dynamic. And once you get to that, then you can start talking about specific technology things like closure. But getting to alternative language to Java is a really, really hard thing to do. And realize that in the other communities that you are casual competitors with but not enemies with, that a rising tide raises all ships. So if the Scala guys are really super successful getting functional programming into the mainstream, then you can piggyback on that success very easily because you're a functional language too. But remember, you're bringing a gun to a knife fight. And so the other strategy you can use here is to encapsulate the entire world. They're not going to build a bridge to you, you've got to build a bridge to them. Other communities are not going to make it easier for, for closure to work with their stuff, but the closure community can make it easier for their stuff to work with you. Remember, you're bringing a gun to a knife fight. Integrating your stuff with theirs is going to be way easier than them integrating their stuff with yours. Did I say that right? I think I said the, the same thing twice today, didn't I? Uh, integration toward closure is going to be a lot harder than integration from closure to something else because you have a gun at a knife fight. You have a language that is infinitely morphable and can wrap up other things that are going to be hard for them to wrap your stuff up with. Encapsulate all the cool stuff that's out in the world. I think it'd be awesome if somebody created a rockin' cool closure library that sits on top of Akka, which is the actor library from Scala. If you could create a better front end on Akka than Scala has, then you've won. Because you're using their underlying bits, but you've created a better interface to interact with that capability that's there. Even if you already have that capability in the closure world, and even if your capability is better, first you've got to build a bridge to all those other technologies and get them used to you before you can start displacing those other technologies. So I would say wrapper everything. Take any interesting Java API in the world and create good closure protocol versions of it, a really clean, nice API, and wrapper all the messiness of that stuff up. 
and get people to start using your wrapper version of stuff just because you have a really clean API that solves a bunch of the messiness underneath. So here are the parts of my master plan that I've talked about one piece at a time. And I haven't actually said anything that's surprising to anyone here, I don't think. Because there's no silver bullets to make this happen. It's just not something that is an easy problem to solve. But the point that I wanted to make here is that if, you, if this is an aspirational goal for this community, if the closure community really wants to penetrate into the enterprise, you're going to have to, as a community, do some work toward that. You're going to have to have a little bit of strategizing. It doesn't have to be really sophisticated, you know, invade a country kind of strategizing. But you need to choose some messages that you can stay on and hammer home anytime you're talking to a CTO or some decision maker about closure. You want to always hit them with the message that you that you're, uh, that you're, uh, have established. Look at the successful open source projects that have penetri penetrated the enterprise. Things like Spring. Spring in the early days was a whole bunch of uh, open source guys putting together, but very quickly, once they started getting penetration, they built a strategy around Spring at Spring Source and very, very decidedly uh, assigned people to do particular kinds of work that they didn't really want to do. Volunteers are easy in the open source space, but to solve real problems, you have to do messy things. And so Spring hired people to solve these messy things that needed to be done, and they have now penetrated very deeply into the enterprise. So it takes some work to do that, but uh, it has to be an initiative that is run from the grassroots, I think, because it's going to be really hard for closure to rein in from above until we get some super, super compelling either tools or success stories or something like that that makes it the overcome the friction enough and the fear. Until then, the best strategy is definitely the grassroots from the bottom up strategy. And the best way to do that is to encapsulate all these other guys and to, well, do all this stuff. That's all I have. Does anybody have questions or disputations about this? I should probably say before you start disputing this that I was telling uh, Mike Nygaard, who I was with in Sweden uh, two days ago, that I was doing this talk, and he said, I would love to come right after you and do the cynics rebuttal to your talk. <laughs> I said, well, you have to do that next year. So uh, uh, cynical rebut rebutation is uh, welcome, but uh, that's all I have. So, yeah. So how would you So his question is basically, and, and you should not believe this is a ThoughtWorks approach. This is just a me approach. I just happen to have ThoughtWorks on my business card. So just, just to make sure that this is not some grand strategy that we've come up with. Uh, this is just all my stuff. But his be question basically is, should we even bother the enterprise? I mean, is that just a lost cause? And there's a, a certainly a good argument that says, you know what, we should ignore those guys. And I can certainly uh, understand that. Um, but there are pros and cons to that. You can always stay in the kind of small, middle-sized market, but it's really hard to get huge penetration and get that tipping point kind of uh, uh, level of language where not only do you have a, a huge community, but you have other people building tons of stuff to support all of your other stuff. So uh, I, that's a good question. I think the community needs to decide. Do we really care about doing this much penetration in the enterprise? Is that some place we want to be, or would we rather be and you know, smaller, small to medium size, small to medium sized company, or aggressive startups, or something like that. I think it's a good question. I don't, I don't have a, a firm answer to that. I would really like to see it in the enterprise because the overwhelming characteristic of enterprise software is ridiculous complexity and a lot of really stupid tools that are doing a Swiss Army chainsaw kind of tools that do 40 different things poorly at one time. Uh, so I would love to see simple, elegant, standalone solutions in the enterprise, which is why I care about it there, but I don't know if the community cares about it as much as I do. So. Uh, I think part of this point might be, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if businesses are built using closure, then that would make it easier for the enterprise people to accept it, because now it's more proven. So, so exactly. That's... So his point is that this, that's basically a grassroots. If small companies start using it, then a lot of small companies use it, and companies will start, taking, will start noticing it. That's really my mollify hashtag, of mollifying because it's become so pervasive that it's not scary anymore. It's like Ruby on Rails did. I mean, 
You can absolutely, if you want to see the, the classic case study of a brand new radical technology penetrating into the enterprise, Ruby on Rails is the classic case because it was below everyone's radar and then managed just by proving itself over and over again that it was worth investing time and effort into. Uh, a less radical version that's Spring, but Spring has also been super successful starting from open source volunteer and then look at Spring Source now. It's, it is as big and complicated as Java ever was now uh, by itself, which is also something that always happens to uh, tech communities. So you can't make that go away. Yeah? yeah it seems to me that uh, you're, you're trying to use uh, social means to what seems to me like more of a technical problem. Uh, if you want to and uh, whatever other language, uh, Java will be calling this. Uh, well, I, in fact, he said, so why not just build an automated tool that translates between these two languages? Please build me that tool and I will take it to every enterprise on earth. I think you will find that's a hard problem uh, because it's been tried a bunch of times before. Um, so, but, uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Call me in a month. Call me in a month. Okay, good. <laughs> I'll count on that. Yeah. So nobody got burned by a bad implementation of Ruby in the 70s. So how can we overcome the parentophobia that all the by poor performance? So his question was, nobody got burned by poor, poor performance by uh, Ruby in the uh, 70s, so how can we overcome that now? Yeah, they got burned by Ruby poor, poor, poor performance in the 90s, the late 90s. Uh, Ruby has never been a high-performing language, but I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yep, so, and so the question really is the baggage that, that Liz has. But see, from an enterprise standpoint, it has no baggage because they don't know what it is. Nobody in the enterprise knows what Lisp is unless somebody's got a computer science background and he remembers it from a class he took in college. I really don't think it has much baggage in the enterprise. It's a complete unknown in most places. In fact, you could sell a closure and not even say it's a list, and most people would say would not even think anything about it until they saw the code, and then they're obviously going to react to it. But that's at the developer level, not at the decision maker level. So actually, I think the baggage is not a bad thing for a closure. In fact, there was a great uh, or an interesting thing not too long ago called the, the blog entry called The Curse of Lisp, that why Lisp has never been a really big thing is because it's so easy to build your own stuff that nobody ever built standard stuff. You always just build everything from scratch because it's so easy to build stuff from scratch. So you never really had standard web frameworks and all that other stuff. Uh, but see, I think Clojure actually solves that problem for the most case because look at ARC, the Paul Graham new version of Lisp that he talked about. Building ARC was easy. It was a month. Eh, a month, yeah, I'll build ARC. But building all the stinking libraries is a, it's several hundred man years worth of stuff. Because you've got to talk to relational databases and SOAP and REST and all that junk. Writing all that stuff takes forever, but Clojure doesn't have to rewrite all that stuff because it's already there in Java. So I think that's a huge selling point that actually a lot of the baggage that Lisp has gets discarded because you have that, that underlying strata of Java code that you can call. You can still build your own stuff on top of it, but there's now a standard strata of stuff that you can call. So I think that actually solves some of that, that curse of Lisp stuff. And actually, I've, I've never once, as I've brought this up to anybody in an enterprise, had Lisp as the number one uh, disagreement about it, the, the characteristic of Lisp. It's always the unknownness that's more. Yes, Rich. Uh, I thought the talk was great, full of things that are undeniably true. But what are your first premises? I think it's the big problem with what you're proposing. What are the first premises of what you're proposing? By definition, you're saying some of the decision makers make decisions on the basis of the fact that they really undervalued people. They want cheap, replaceable people. Yep. And uh, I'd like to believe that it's aligned with the value people quite highly. And, and so how do you resolve that conflict? So that's a, Richard makes a, an outstanding point here is that one of my first premises was what the CTO really want have low value for people. They want low value cogs that they can fit in to do development and closure is the opposite of that. You really need engaged people to do that. Uh, I think that's another thing that we've got to convince CTOs and other people of that you don't need 200 developers, you need four or five developers or 10 maybe at the max. Uh, and I think uh, Ruby is helping that some because Ruby teams tend to be a lot smaller uh, but they're also more expensive right now, which is hurting us some. But I think that they're, they're kind of blazing a trail toward you can have get more done with a smaller team. So we really need to push that idea that, you know, it's, 
it's been frustrating for me forever and for a lot of people in this room that companies that spend money on 50 developers could take a fraction of that money and buy a bunch of, of 10 really good developers and pay them like kings and still save money and get more software out the back end. Well, that's such a hard argument to make because it's deeply unintuitive. It's really unintuitive that more people can't dig a ditch, dig a deeper ditch faster but we're not digging ditches, we're, we're doing knowledge work. So that's one of the things we're going to have to overcome. And fortunately, Ruby's helping that some, and we're pushing that hard everywhere we go. But uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small candle in a, in a hurricane right now, unfortunately. Yeah, I got time probably for one more. You guys are disappointed a little bit. I mean, there's a human component to that, too. Companies are building these slugs, and people want to inspire everybody. You know, so they're like, if you really want to adopt them, So he makes a good point that you don't really need to displace all these developers that are already there. You need to teach them because nobody wants to wholesale replacement all their staff, fire the 200 people and hire 10 really good people. You got to build a bridge toward them. And that's uh, part of uh, kind of the subtext of this is create closures to everywhere. You need to have a really strong outreach to create. And that's probably going to have to be grassroots because if you try to rain it down from above, then you've got to sell them on the idea of training classes and all this other stuff. Whereas if you get people learning it on their own and then starting to evangelize it internally, I think that helps. Um, but I think that uh, writing good closure code, just like writing any really good dense code, uh, takes a lot of thought and consideration, and that's not super valued at a lot of enterprises now for stupid reasons, but that's something, that's another mind shift that's got to happen. But I think that mind shift's got to happen for software development in general, so I think that's another rising tide. We can kind of help that as, as we do this for a bunch of other languages, because I think we're coming to uh, the end of this, con this experiment that you can take really Languages are designed to keep people out of trouble and put a lot of poor developers working in those languages and produce useful software. I think that idea has kind of lost its, a lot of its sheen, if it ever had any. So I said that was the last one, but I'll do uh, one more, so we'll do the middle of that. That's exactly right. So his point is it's, it's all nice and good to move into the enterprise because we're all hippie evangelists and want to make the world a better place with closure, but the enterprise also has tons and tons of money. And tons and tons of money allow you to build other things, which the Spring guys discovered, um, much to their delight. There's a lot of money in the enterprise, so that may be another reason you want to get there. Just uh, if you use that money to fund other things that are more altruistic, get into the enterprise just so that uh, you can get all that good uh, paper from the, from the enterprise. So uh, I'm guessing there are lots more uh, conversations to be had about this, and I'll be happy to have those uh, during drinks and other stuff tonight. But my time is up, and I want to give room for someone to say something actually really useful. And so I will leave the stage. Uh, thank you very much, and hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>